Tiffany, thank you so much. Awesome. Hey, I am not uh, Pastor Elliot, but it is awesome to be with you guys. So, um, hey, this is my first time at Lifeline Church, and I just love it. Man, I've been felt so welcome um, from the time I, I've come in and just love being a part of what God's doing here um, on Hutchins Street, such a uh, significant church here in our town. So I love it. Um, my name is Glenn, as you heard, and uh, I'm the pastor at First Baptist Church. Um, I've actually been a pastor at First Baptist Church for 30 years. I'm almost uh, finishing my 30 year here at the beginning of June. I'll be starting my uh, 31st year. And so, um, yeah, thank, I, thank you. I mostly just have hung around. I just, you know, stay. but uh, God's really been able to, uh, to bless just being able to be in that same community for a long time. One of the things that, 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 that's come out of that is to be able to be a part of, of Love Lodi and what it means for us as a church to be known, not for all the things that we're against, but to be known for what Jesus says we should be known for, for by our our love for one another and our love for our community. And so Love Lodi has always been kind of special to my heart. I've been able to be uh, one of the leaders of that a movement for a while. And this idea of swapping pulpits, I think, is just a really uh, fun thing because hopefully as much, honestly, more than even the message that I have today, hopefully you will remember the message that we are one body of Christ. And whether it's First Baptist and Lifeline or all different Bible-believing churches around this city, we're following the same God and we're on the same team and we've got the same mission. And so uh, this, is, this is great. It's fun for me to get to know a little bit uh, about your church. I pray for it as I drive by and I'll be able to do it with a lot more faces and a lot more um, knowledge. So thank you, Tiffany and Mark and the rest of the, the team for really welcoming me in. It's been uh, great. And so hopefully Elliot's having a good time over there at First Baptist um, as well. So um, hey, so our topic today is home is where the heart is. And Elliot asked if I would speak on that, which I'm happy to do. It's kind of a significant topic for me at this time in my life. I'm at kind of a, a new stage in my role as, as a family. And that our, uh, for the first time, uh, my wife and I are, are empty nesters. In fact, I think I have a little picture of my family here. I can show you uh, some of our family. There's my wife, Jannie, there on the, the right. My son, Andrew, and his wife, Jessica, um, who are newly married. You'll hear about them in a little bit. And then my daughter, uh, Grace, who is a, a special ed teacher down in San Diego. And then my daughter to the left of her, just beside me, Mary, is graduating from college and getting married. And so this is like a big stage for us. We've got our second child getting married, which is both terrifying and super significant. And in the last six weeks, maybe the most exciting news is, I think we got a little picture of that, uh, we are new grandparents, which is super fun. And so our little uh, granddaughter, Taylor, uh, was actually was actually born about six weeks early, so she was in the NICU for a couple weeks. Um, but God was really faithful through that, and um, and that was uh, that's so that's our family. So this is a, a significant time for us. We're experiencing a lot of of change. And my deal is every season of life, when they were well, you know, before we were even married, and, and then when, when we were married, and then having kids, every part has been really significant, and every part builds on one another. And if God is active in every part of that. That's where the, the blessing comes from, and that's where the joy comes from. And I say that just right up front to encourage you, because I know our topic today is going to be marriage. And we're actually going to dig into kind of like a theology of marriage. And I know not every person here is, in fact, married. And so whether you are or you are not, this is important information, because it's what the Bible teaches us. Um, if you're married, I hope it's an encouragement and a blessing to you. If you are not married, but may be married one day, I actually think today's message is a really um, important one. So... Anyways, before we jump into the topic of God's design for marriage, uh, I got to tell you about a text message that I received on my birthday. Uh, I guess it's a little over a year ago now. And so I think I got a picture of the text message, a screenshot of the picture um, that I received. It was from my mom. And here's a little bit of the backstory. The backstory is uh, my wife and I have owned a Toyota Sequoia for a long time. And we love this Toyota Sequoia. It's been, um, it's like a, you know, kind of a larger SUV. And it's been just a great car for us. My favorite thing about our Toyota Sequoia 
is it always runs. Never problems, it just goes and goes, which is, is great. Um, and so my parents, who live in Lodi, uh, were going up to Donner Lake, up near Truckee. And so they said, hey, we need, to, we need to tow some stuff up there. So they had a trailer. Could we borrow your Sequoia to drive to the mountains to tow a trailer? I'm like, sure, that'd be great. Until on my birthday, I got this little text message. Do we have a picture of that? I know I sent pictures at the last minute, so we may or may not have that. The, I think it's slide, the, the picture there. Well, I can tell you what the text message said. It said, it was a text message from my mom, not the greatest texter at 82, <laughs> but she said this, call us when you get up. We had bear issues. Uh, and then she said, P.S., happy birthday, we love you. So I'm like, OK, I don't know about that. What are these bear issues? And so there's a lot of bears up in, in that area. You guys familiar with this? In fact, we've got, I, I'm not I, I think I gave them pictures at the last minute, so it may or may not work. But I've got some pictures of the potential culprits, uh, these bears, who it might have been, because uh, there's a bunch of bears in that area. Well, about 5.30 in the morning, um, my dad hears an alarm going off in the car, and he comes downstairs. And believe it or not, this bear has actually, with his paw, opened the car door and crawled into the car. Um, and which is amazing, because you're like, how are bears so, I know, uh, this is how they do it. How are bears so good at doors? Well, they're not that good at doors, because this bear crawled into the car, and then the door closed behind him. So now you not only have a bear in my car, you've got a bear stuck in my car. And um, this bear went crazy. There's a picture of one who it might have been there. And, um, and uh, what I was going to say was, um, so my dad comes down and actually opens the door and sees that it's a bear and slams the door shut. And so this bear was trapped in here. Here's just a little picture of what he did to our very reliable Toyota Sequoia. He tore up, and that's just one of the seats. He pulled off the panels of all four doors, trying to get off, <laughs> tore up all of the seats, went to the bathroom in not one place, not two, three spots, front seat, middle seat, back seat, went to the bathroom in all of them. Um, and so just tore up the car. I'm like, oh, OK, mom. And the, the thing was, no damage to the engine. You know, the thing still. So my parents loaded all this stuff in, drive it home to Lodi. I was over at the church, parked it in front of the church, and was like, hey, thanks for letting us borrow your car. You know, worked great. So here's the thing. Like, what do you do when your car looks like that? And I, I was like, I don't know. So I went to the website for our auto insurance. And I didn't know this. Some of you probably do. If you click far enough, it's not on the front page. But if you search far enough, there's a, a spot for wild animal damage. No, no and if you fill that out, then uh, insurance actually helped pay for that. Um, we were able to replace everything. But because it's an older car, it was a ton of work. You know, we had to go find everything, fix everything. And um, it all ended up fine in the end. But I realized a couple things in that experience. One is, if you're going to be in a place where bears are, you need to lock your doors. Because they, they, they operate the doors. And I guess this thing looked like a picnic basket to him. No food in there or anything. But the second thing is something that I real, realized about myself and something I realized about the way that I like my cars. I like my cars to work. I don't really like to have to work on my cars. And as we talk about marriage today, that's kind of a premise that I want, premise that I want us to begin with, is marriage is a little like that. If you're married or you will be married one day or you have friends that are married, you want your marriage to, to work. You want it to be a blessing. You want it to be great. But I don't necessarily want to have to work on it. Yeah. And yet the reality is, is if you want your marriage to not just work, but to be God's design, because that's what we're talking about here today. I'm not talking about having an average marriage. I, I want you to have a picture of God's design for your marriage. And if that's the case, it takes some work and it takes some effort. So we're going to talk about that today. And our topic um, is all about God's design for marriage. But before we even jump into that, there's something that, that you need to know about your marriage. And you probably know this to be true, which is that you have some enemies of your, for your marriage. There's a lot of different enemies. But you have one particular enemy that the Bible compares to a wild animal. The Bible actually says it's not a bear 
but he's like a, a lion. He's like a, a lion prowling around. In fact, 1 Peter, written by Jesus' closest disciple, Peter, years later, who understood after years of walking with God and ups and downs, says this in 1 Peter 4, 8. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Man, you've got to keep your head on straight. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We have a devil who's an, an enemy of the work that God wants to do. Jesus says it like this. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I mentioned I've been in ministry 30 years, and I've learned a number of things. One of the things that is the most clear to me is not only how valuable the family is, but what a target the family is for the enemy. Uh, maybe more than anywhere, if he can attack our families, he can get that foothold into our lives and bring so much destruction. I, I think that's because of a couple of reasons. One, because family is, is so important. As you're going to see, it's a part of God's design of, of how we're made. But the other thing is it, it's, it's, it's valuable to us. Like, it's, it's close to us, and it bears a lot of weight for us. It's, it's something that is um, uh, uh, so, something that's valuable, but it's also something that we are vulnerable in because it doesn't always come easy. And if you drift a little bit, you're losing ground. If you're lowering your guard, you're losing ground. If you're uh, be, you know, open to these things, the, the devil has this opportunity to prowl around and to um, devour us. So we want to talk about that this morning. How do we stick close to God's original design? And to talk about this, we're going to go back to actually the very beginning, the first marriage ever, which is in Genesis chapter 2. So if you have your Bible and you'd like to follow along, I invite you to open up to Genesis chapter chapter 2. And as you know, you're thinking about that and turning there, you know, we know that marriage has been under attack for a while now. In fact, the last statistics that I saw, which are a few years old now, uh, said that in the United States, there were 630,000 divorces um, in 2020. So that's the last statistic I saw. 630,000 divorces in the United States in 2020. That's 1,700 1, uh, every day. That's one and a half divorces in our country every minute. And we're going to get into this, but part of the problem with that is especially younger generations are looking at this thing that, that, that God and the church holds up as this wonderful thing, and they're seeing that it's not as attractive to them as it should be. It's harder than they thought. And so people are not only choosing to get married later, but not maybe get married at all. They've been wounded by marriage. And many of us are in this room and know what it means to be wounded by marriage. And that's because God gives us something good, but the enemy loves to take something that is good, flip it around, and use it for destruction. And so let's talk about God's design for marriage. So it begins in Genesis chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 2, maybe you know the story, I mean, you're familiar with it. God uh, in Genesis 1 creates the heavens and the earth. And every day he creates something new. And the, the pattern is God speaks it, it comes into being, and then at the end of the day, God says, that's good. And so he creates something, it's good. He creates something, it's good. That continues on all the way through Genesis chapter 1. Then in Genesis chapter 2, you have kind of a little bit different order to it. You see that, that God kind of pulls out and describes how he creates um, Adam and Eve. But the first thing that God creates that he says is not good is after he creates Adam, who is the man, and Adam is alone. And God says it is not good for the man to be alone. And so Adam is, is lost. And so he's looking around for what the Bible calls a suitable helper, something that's going to complete and kind of uh, uh, fulfill and, and, and uh, complete who he is. And so they bring all the animals to him. Nothing ever works. And, and so finally, God says, this is what we're going to do. And he creates um, the, the woman. He creates Eve. And when he first creates Eve, the very first response of Adam, the very first re response of man when he sees this woman is a poem. He, he breaks out in this song, this poem. It's not the most romantic poem, but as you're going to see, I think it's appropriate. And that's where we want to begin this morning. Genesis 2.23 says this. Genesis 2.23 says, this is now bone of my bones 
and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So as I said, not the, like the greatest pickup line of all time, but he's, he sees Eve and he's like, wow, this is, this is it. Um, she was bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. God causes, causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep and out of his side, he takes a rib and, and fashions the, the woman out of that. Uh, the, the Hebrew there is, is kind of important because it, if to us it doesn't sound like the greatest poem, but in Hebrew there's at least some poetry to it and some kind of rhyme and wordplay to it. Uh, it says, Isha is the, 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 the Hebrew word for the woman, taken out of Ish. So Ish is the man, Isha is the woman. And there's this idea that not only are they closely related to one another, but they're almost two sides of a, of a, complete, uh, of a, of a, of a, of a complete whole. They go together and they make this whole. And Adam bursts into this song. And so for the first time, it's not just Adam, but it's Mrs. Adam. And you have right here the very first Adam's family right here. <laughs> But Adam, I know, sorry. <laughs> my, my, by the way, First Baptist, they would not laugh at all. <laughs> they would just groan and be like, roll their eyes. And so, but uh, anyways. Um, so Adam is like, wow, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. And there's this sense of joy that causes him to break out in a song. John Calvin, who uh, translated the, the Bible uh, in his day, translated this verse like this. Now at length I have obtained a suitable companion who is a part of the substance of my flesh and in whom I behold as if it were another self. Man and woman, unique, designed for one another, out of one another, for one another. Matthew Henry, who's a Bible commentator, says this. He says, the woman was made out of the rib of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. And so you've got this beautiful picture, um, and then there's a description of how this thing is going to work itself out. So after Adam's poem, the next verse gives us some descriptions of how this new relationship is going to happen. So now we're to verses 24 and 25, where it says this, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So I want us to see three things that take place after God creates Adam and Eve, that very first marriage, uh, and then there's a description of some things that should happen to make this marriage um, what it's supposed to be. And I, I want to just share uh, these three things with you. The first one is this. Notice that they are to leave their past dependencies. It says specifically that a man will leave his father and mother, but a woman will also leave uh, her father and mother and be joined together with the, their spouse. Now, in our culture, this doesn't ring quite quite as profound as it did in, in those days, because obviously in biblical times and, and even into the not very distant past, the family that you were raised on was not only your family, but it was a place of your protection. It was a place of your provision. It's where you had your needs taken care of. It's where you found your human fulfillment. It was all those things. And so God says, no, but when Adam and Eve come together, they leave behind, and those that would, Adam and Eve that would come after them, us, we leave our father and mother and are joined together with our wife. So we, we leave those things behind. We cut those cords. Now, some of you are like, man, I lived on my own for years. It was not hard to leave my father and mother. But it doesn't necessarily have to be your parents. Where are your past dependencies? What are the things that you look to for fulfillment? Where do you turn to for human protection? Where do you turn to for human provision? Because what this says is it's time to cut the cord on those things and to lean into your, your spouse, man and woman. By the way, if you're kind of in my age of life or stage of life where your kids are getting married, parents, this is so important for us to allow our kids to do this yeah. and to give them some space. And it's really tricky because, like I said, I've got a son who's just uh, married a year and a half. I've got tons of great advice for him. I mean, <laughs> just gold. And if he asks me, 
I'm happy to share it with them. And so parents, sometimes we got to really hold our tongue there. The good news is, is when we show that restraint, before long they do come. My wife and I read a book a few years ago um, that was called, it was um, Raising Adult Children, and the topic, or the, the subtitle was, Leave the Welcome Mat Out and Your Mouth Shut. And so I thought that was pretty good advice. But we see that we leave past dependencies, and we become uh, dependent upon one another in this relationship. In fact, the very next thing it says is that we are united together. It leaves its father and mother, and they unite together. The old King James says, you leave and you cleave. Any if you've been around long enough, you've heard that expression. You leave and you cleave. And cleave is this idea of permanence. It's an indissoluble uh, union. It's something that's not broken up. The Hebrew word is debauch. It implies permanence or an indissoluble union. It says to cling, to stick, to stay close, to cleave, to stick to, to stick with, or to follow closely. That's the idea of this union that comes together. Because now you're finding your protection, your provision, your dependence in one another. And God says that this marriage relationship is different from the other human relationships. There's all kinds of important human relationships, but that marriage relationship is different. God describes it actually as a covenant relationship. And so maybe you've heard this talked about before, but the way the Bible talks about marriage is not like a simple agreement, not even like a contract that two people enter into, but it talks about it as a sacred covenant. We don't have a lot of covenants, or we don't think like that in, in our day. We're familiar with contracts. Like, I've got a contract with my cell phone provider. And, you know, if they do a good job, great, maybe I'll renew it. But if someone offers, comes along, offers better service, cheaper price, what am I going to do? I'm going to break that old contract, or maybe come to the end of that contract, and I'm going to sign up for a new one, because now I found something better. I found something that works better, that meets my needs more, and so I'm going to change from that to that. That's not the way the Bible talks about marriage. The Bible talks about marriage as a, a covenant. Now, covenants, as I mentioned, are these really sacred things that we see from the very beginning of the Bible all the way through um, to the very end. In fact, there are at least kind of five main covenants. Um, and let me just kind of review these with you because they help us to understand a little bit of why God talks about marriage as a covenant. So there is a covenant that God enters into with Noah after the flood. And uh, he says, we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna be in this covenant relationship that I won't flood the earth anymore. Um, and then he has a covenant with Abraham. And he says, Abraham, we're going to be in a covenant relationship. I will be your, your God. You will be my people. And, and your, your nation, your, the people from you will be like the stars of the, the sky. And from you will come one who is a blessing to all nations. And I will bless you is the covenant God makes with Abraham. Then with Moses, there's a covenant that, that God gives him the law to follow. And they follow the law. And his covenant, God says, I'll lead you into the promised land. And again, I will be your God. There's another covenant with David that says, from you there will always be a king on the throne that is, that is from the, the line of David. That's why it's so significant that we see that Jesus is the, the, the lion from the tribe of Judah, from David's line is Christ. That was a covenant promise. And then Jesus, when he gathers together with his disciples in the upper room, what does he say to them? He says, this body, this bread, this blood is a new covenant with you. And the significance of that covenant there was that no longer do we have to, 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 to earn our way to, to God by obeying all the laws or keeping all the, the rules, but that our forgiveness for our sins would be provided through his body and his blood broken and poured out for us. And he says, this is a sign of a new covenant. And the disciples would have said, oh, whoa, because there's only ever been four covenants in the history of time. And now there's this fifth one. Do you see how significant they are? And God says marriage is the human covenant. Now, a little bit about this, maybe more information than you need to know, but covenants in the Bible are always initiated by a vow or a promise. You know, this is, I will be your God, you will be my people, and we're going to vow together um, for that. 
They usually in include conditions that you're going to be faithful, you're going to obey my law, those kind of things. Um, they are ratified by, by blood. In the Old Testament, there's often a, a sacrifice, and that, that blood ratifies that covenant. And then there's always a sign that seals the covenant, right? And so yesterday, I walked outside, and I saw this beautiful <laughs> rainbow. Did you guys notice that? And I said, thank you, God, that you are never going to flood the, the whole earth again because that was the covenant sign that God gave to Noah, this rainbow. And then Abraham gets a sign, you're going to be my people, and I'll be your God, and, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And the sign, you guys remember the sign for that? It's, it's circumcision. And Abraham's like, how come Noah gets a rainbow and we get circumcision? <laughs> And on and on it goes. But if you think about that, think about your marriage. It's initiated by a vow. You stood up before God and before people hopefully said something like, in sickness or in health, for better or worse, till death do us part. And you vowed to one another. And you made promises of faithfulness to one another. Ratified by blood is kind of a weird way to say that, but there's that sexual union of people coming together and it's sealed by a sign. I'm wearing this little wedding ring right here that, that even if you don't, have never met my wife, Jannie, you're, you're like, oh yeah, there's a sign that shows uh, their relationship. And so covenant is this very high view of marriage. And God says, you leave behind your old relationships, you join together in a covenant relationship. And, and how do I know this is so significant? Because look at the way God describes it next in Genesis 2. He says, and you become one flesh. Whew. One flesh. That is the ultimate move of God's design in marriage, because we move at this point from being just about me to about we. In fact, I shared some of this message with my church in the past, and we call it this. We're moving from me, where it's all about me, to we're moving to we. And that one flesh describes this intimacy that God designed and is so beautiful and we long for it. And that one flesh is certainly the sexual union and, and that physical intimacy, that's a significant part of it, not to be forsaken, not to be pushed away. Um, but it's more than that. It's this, this intimacy that says all of me for all of you. And all of you I received to all of me. And they were naked and they were unashamed and they, they had this closeness with one another. And when you think about that and you go back and you read about that, doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound awesome? I hope that you have a longing for that kind of marriage. And I also really wish that this was the end of the sermon and we could all just like go grab coffee and go out to lunch. But it's not the end of the sermon because it's not the end of the story. Because you probably know what comes next in the story, right? God gives them this beautiful thing, and he blesses them, and they, they're naked, and they're unashamed. They've got perfect unity with God. And then you turn to Genesis chapter 3, and the very next page, like the very next page, sin enters into the world, and it corrupts everything. And it messes up our relationship with God. It messes up our relationship even with the creation. It messes up our peace with other people. And probably the, the, the most obvious casualty to the, the entrance of sin is it messes up this relationship between Adam and Eve. Because Genesis 3, 6 and 7 says this, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing for the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it, which was an act of rebellion, because God said, have everything you want, just not that. But in an act of rebellion, she thought she knew better. She ate that, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it, and then their eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. And what's the very first thing they do? So they sew fig leaves together, and they make coverings for themselves. The very first uh, attack or the very first response to sin is that intimacy, that vulnerable, vulnerability, that beauty that God created me for. Now is, I don't. Now I've got to hide. Now I don't want to be seen. Now it's too hard to be close. Now it's too much work. I just want my marriage to work. I don't want to work on it, right? And so they they create these fig leaves to to cover themselves. And we still see, obviously, that the result of sin um, today it has huge impact on in so many parts of the world. But today, would you not agree that it's having a huge impact on our marriages? Yeah. And God says, no, 
I've designed you for something better. So Genesis chapter 2 is what Bible scholars call a, a primary source passage. A primary source passage basically means it's something that's taught earlier in the Bible that is referred to in other places. So this idea of marriage, leave your father and mother, join to your wife, you become one flesh. This is now a pattern that's been established in creation, and it's the pattern throughout the Bible, and it doesn't change. It change. And it's a primary source passage, meaning that all kinds of other authors in the Bible come back to it. So they come back to it in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul comes back to it when he describes describes uh, marriage in, in Ephesians, maybe somewhere else. And Jesus comes back to it when he talks about marriage in Matthew chapter 19 and in Mark chapter 10. And that's where I want us to really uh, dig into for our next just short time that we have together, Mark chapter 10. Because in that situation, there's a great crowd of people that are following Jesus. And that, that's kind of the way it works. And so there's this crowd of people that were following Jesus and they're going to trap him and they're going to trick him, and they're going to trick him with the question about marriage. And so they come to him, and they say, hey, you know, Jesus, when is it okay for us to get a divorce? And I guess it's an honest question, but it's, it's, it's the wrong question. Um, and they say, well, then, you know, doesn't Moses' law allow for divorce and unfaithfulness? And Jesus says, yes, that's true, but, but that was given to you for for a hardness of heart. In other words, Jesus said, yeah, there, that unfaithfulness is part of that, or, or the faithfulness is part of that condition, and when it's broken, there is grounds for divorce biblically, if you want to say it like that, but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. And I know many relationships that even included some horrible past and even included infidelity that did the work and let God restore it and leaned in, and now are living in a happy and, and healthy marriage. And so Jesus says, he says, yeah, that's, there, there is because of a hardness of heart, that's, that's what it's going to be. And can I just add something here? That's the wrong question to ask. You know, and one of my great frustrations as a, a pastor, and I can say this at someone else's church. <laughs> one of my great frustrations as a pastor is when someone comes to me or a couple comes and they're like, our marriage is in trouble. I'm like, okay, great, let's, let's work on that. But they're like at the point of divorce and we're separated and we're filing for divorce and it's, you know, and, and, and they, people come for help when they're already so far down the road. And I think to myself so many times, where were you two years ago when this started? when we could, could work on it. And as Christians, we've got to break down that barrier that says I can't be honest and real when I'm struggling. And then, you know, it's got to be some big re reveal. I would have loved to have heard from these couples, like I said, two years ago and said, hey, can, can you help us with this? And maybe they get connected with a counselor or a group in the church or, or you know, things like that. And so my encouragement to you is, is don't wait. Get help. If you start to have those, those, those struggles, which we all do, we all do. I remember clear times. I've told you my wife and I, or maybe I didn't tell you we've been married 30, oh man. <laughs> I never thought I'd be that old guy that can't even tell you. We've been married 33 years, I believe, maybe 32. I'm not sure. She's not here, so I'm going to say we've been married 33 years. Um, we've had some great times. We've had some hard times. I, I still remember about you know, six, seven years into it where I'm like, I don't know if this is, is going to work. And... It's so hard to take off those fig leaves and be vulnerable with one another, but take them off and be vulnerable with others and to get the help um, that we need. And so Jesus says, you know, yeah, they're, you know, the, the, because of hardness of heart, this is what it says. But then he goes back to the source passage. He goes back to God's design for marriage. And in Mark chapter 10, this is what he says. But at the beginning of creation, remember, I've told you how it's supposed to work. At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. But at the time that Jesus said that, that was probably not a super loaded or even that controversial of a statement. Obviously, in our culture, that's become a real hot button issue. And, and this is not me being judgmental or anything. This is just me saying we see God's design, that God creates people as we are. And part of God's creation is, I created you male, and I created you female. And we may have all kinds of feelings where it doesn't feel like I'm in line with God's, you know, what God's made, but, but that doesn't change the fact that God created 
male and God created female. And even if you're wrestling and you're struggling with that, that doesn't mean that, that, that God's not in that. And parents, one of the really beautiful things that we can do with our kids is just to affirm that truth in our kids' lives in the very simplest way to say, you know what, man? I'm so God. I'm so glad that God made you to be a little girl. That's just so awesome that God loved you so. Man, he made you a girl. Or God made you a little boy, and that's awesome. And, and we affirm that, you know, in age-appropriate ways all the way up um, and through. So uh, he says, uh, God created, uh, uh, Jesus said, at the beginning, God made them male and female. And then he goes back to our passage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. And we're like, yes, Jesus, we've heard that. And then he adds this phrase that is, I think, the phrase for us today. He says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Because Jesus acknowledges everything that we've been talking about here already this morning, which is that God made this beautiful design for marriage, and there is an enemy that wants to attack it and separate it. And while there's one enemy, the devil, there are all kinds of ploys that he uses to separate our marriage. And so if you could sit tight for just a few more minutes, what I want to do is I want to identify some of the things that are trying to separate our marriages in our world today. And let me throw these out there, see if these are something that, that relate to you, because there's all kinds of, of issues that we face, right? You have financial problems, you have kid problems, you have in-law problems, you've got work problem, you know, there's uh, addictions, there's a, a great rise in infidelity, and, and I met someone online, and I did, there's all of these things, but all of them really are, are symptoms of things that are going on on, on even a deeper level. Um, and so what I want to do is just try to shine some light on some of the ways that these the enemy is trying to do exactly what Jesus said shouldn't happen, which is separate these marriages. And so I want to look at three things. Exterior, kind of cultural influences. Then I want to talk a little bit about just some relational issues. And then I want to talk about some stuff that's going on inside each and every one of us that will work against our marriage. So uh, first of all, some exterior and cultural um, forces, um, which is marriage. Uh, the message in our culture is that marriage is all about self-fulfillment. Remember we said God's design is that I move from me to we. Adam was was, was, was uh, it was not good for him to be alone. There, that, that he was going to find his fullness is the second half of, of who he was in this woman. And yet marriage, we've been told, is all about me being fulfilled and me getting mine and me being happy. So I mentioned that statistic that there are 630,000 divorces in the United States in 2020. Um, and that's a lot. The divorce rate for a while now, and I hate to even talk about this stuff, but it's, it's important for us to talk about. The divorce rate for a while in the United States has hovered right around 50%. That, that's a lot. I think of all the weddings that I've done as a, a pastor, and I think, oh, you know, 50% of these. But we know it to be true. Maybe you know it to be true in your life and your family. But did you know that if you go back not even that far in our history, that that's not always been the case. Even about 50 years ago, and I'm not trying to stand up here and say, oh, the good old days, but I am trying to say that, that our, our views on marriage have, have really evolved and changed as a culture. Because about 50 years ago, that divorce rate was, was far less, probably about 75% of, um, well, it's, it was half, it was about a quarter of, of the people, 75% of all adults were married 50 years ago. Now do you know, only 50%, and it's even less than 50% of adults are not Married, And you can live a perfectly fulfilled life. Not married. Marriage is not for every single person. That's not at all what I'm saying. But what I'm saying, if it's part of our God's design that we're going to find this in a spouse, that, that, that it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good thing to, to shoot for. And less than half of our population is experiencing that. Um, 50 years ago, the, the number of people that would be living together apart from being married um, would have been like in the low single digit digits. They hardly even measured it. Now, one third of all unmarried women between the ages of 25 and 40 are living with a partner that they're not married to. And I just share some of those. That's kind of just a few statistics that are, are chosen to show this dramatic shift in how our culture views marriage these days. Because these statistics and others like them show that there's this 
what I would call unbiblical idea of marriage that's crept into our culture and become the most prominent one. What do I mean by that? Well, here are some false assumptions that you hear all the time. And these are things that have just worked them way uh, throughout our culture. One is that most marriages are unhappy. What do you hear people talk about? You got oh, the old ball and chain, right? Or, and there's this idea that's promoted, whether it's in media or whatever, that you know, man, it's, it's most marriages are unhappy. And yet the reality is most marriages do go through difficult times. But I, not to overwhelm you with statistics, but this is one that I've always held on to, is two-thirds of couples that say, hey, we're really struggling and divorce or separation is, is, is what's coming next for us. Two-thirds of those couples that admit this is the direction we're going, if you ask them five years later and they've remained married, Two-thirds of them will say, you know what, now I'm in a happy marriage. And it just shows you that not only do we go through these cycles, but we want our marriage to work, but we don't want to work on it. But we've got to put in the work to, to do those things, to, to, to see that, that blessing. A second thing, a kind of just a cultural assumption, and, and this is idea. This idea is, is really prominent inside and out of the church, that living together before we get married is just going to be a great way to discover if we're really compatible. And it makes sense, right? You know, you got to live together. You got to make sure we're sexually compatible. And so there's this sense that that's how you discover if you're um, compatible. Even those statistics still to this day show that uh, the, the couples that live together before they're married have a higher rate of, of divorce. And the earlier that sex is introduced into a relationship, uh, the shorter that relationship tends to be. It's more likely to break up. Third thing that's just kind of a cultural assumption out there these days is that the key to a lasting marriage is like finding the one perfect person out there who's going to fulfill me. And I call this like the Disney princess view of, of marriage. And we've all got that in us. Like we long for that romantic person that's going to fulfill me. And that longing for romance and that, that perfect person is, is awesome and it's great and it should be chased after. But as important as our marriage relationship is, it is not the thing that ultimately fulfills us. God is the thing that ultimately fulfills us. Why is this so important? Because if I have this belief that Hollywood taught me from the time that I was young enough to watch every Disney movie that I have to find just the compatible person is this. If I get five or six years into my marriage and suddenly it's really hard, you know what my mind starts to think? Maybe this isn't the one. Maybe this is not the compatible one. And, and it's so easy to, and I, and I don't feel fulfilled. And so it must be her or it must be him. And yet the reality is, is our fulfillment is not meant to come ultimately from our spouse. Our fulfillment comes from Christ and we can't change them. We can change ourselves. So how do we lean into those things? There's a, a great quote about the early church. So here's my thing. Marriages and families, Christian marriages and families have to look different. They have to look different than the, the marriages and the families that, that we see out there because the world is dying for something that they can hold on to and sink their teeth into. And this is nothing new. Listen to this uh, quote that goes back to, it's like the third century, maybe even the second century, that talks about Christian marriages. And it talked about how in the pagan culture, the Roman culture, where the church kind of came up, it said that, that the pagan culture was very stingy with their money, but promiscuous with their bodies. So in other words, they, they wouldn't share any money with anybody but they would share their, their bodies and they would share sex with everyone. And then came along these Christian people that nobody knew what to do with. And it said about the Christians that they were generous with their money and they were exclusive with their body. And some people are like, well, they're no fun at all. But you know what else happened? A lot of people began to look at that and say, man, I want that. Uh, because God's put something in our heart to long for what he's made for us. And in our world, there are people looking around and said, man, what I'm doing now isn't working, and I need to see something different. Yeah. So my wife and I, um, we, we're empty nesters, so we have a little time. And one of the things that we do is we go out almost most nights that, that we're home and available, and we'll go out for a walk together. And we'll just kind of walk around the neighborhood. And, and oftentimes, I just kind of, I didn't even know we were doing this, but oftentimes we would hold hands. And I've probably had three neighbors say to me, man, 
going, what do you guys, how do you, what are you guys doing? <laughs> like, I'm like, I, don't, I just love my wife. And basically what they've said to me is, man, I really want that. I really want that. And some are younger couples, some are older couples. And it's not like we're even doing anything that special. We're just trying to be faithful to what's God. And the point is people are really looking for that. And yet there's this cultural force that is warring against marriages. A second thing that's warring against marriages, and, and when Jesus says, don't let anybody, let what God's joined together, let nobody separate, is relationship battles between one another. And I just want to mention a couple of them. Um, one is unrealistic expectations. We come into marriage, and one of the, real, uh, one of the expectations is, is that she's going to fulfill me, or he's going to fulfill me, and she's going to be the answer to all my problems, and everything's going to be perfect. And we come in with these expectations that we don't even know. And then when those expectations aren't met, again, we're back in the place of asking, well, maybe she's not the one. And maybe there's a better route. And maybe, oh, this person over here looks a little better. Those kind of things. So there's kind of these relationship battles. And I mentioned that Janie and I were about five, six years into our marriage. And, and I think when we hit probably our toughest time where I had to wonder, and I'm a pastor, and from a, she's from this really great Christian family. And I'm like, I'm not sure we're, we're going to make it. And how's that all going to happen? Um, the heart of that was me, probably more than her, with these unrealistic expectations. Because I came in thinking that, that she was going to do all of these things. And, and if you, you're familiar with this love language idea, my love language has always been physical touch and um, uh, affirming words. You know, it, that's, those are work for me. For hers, they're just the opposite. She wants to spend quality time, and she wants acts of service. And so I'm like, well, if she really loved me, where's all the kind words? You know, how come she's not telling me, great job, honey, and you're doing so great, and wow. Um, and it's not that she didn't think that, but it just was not her, her love language. And I'm like, well, where's all that physical touch and that, in, you know, that weird intimacy that we longed for? And God says they're naked and unashamed. And, you know, where's all? And so all there's, there's unmet expectations. Um, and you know what, honestly, I did? I changed my expectations. I recognize that I can't put that on her. That's not fair. And I'm asking her to meet needs that, that she can't meet. Now, over the years, we've learned and we've grown on that. But it came, came to this place where we were able to, to let go of some of those expectations. But the problem is we live with this great attitude of entitlement that says it's all about me. And, and she's not doing this, and it's her fault, and she's wrong, and I feel this way, and it's all about the spirit of entitlement. Um, and it reminds me of this story that I heard about a, a couple that was heading for divorce. And so the man goes to this lawyer, who's a, in this case a wise lawyer, and the man says to the lawyer, hey, I am done with this lady. We are going to divorce. Will you help me write up the papers? But here's the deal. Things are really bad. And so I don't want to just get divorced. I want to let her have it. I want to like really stick it to her. And so, you know, would you help me write up those papers? And the guy's like, he's like, okay, but you know, I've seen this story before. And if you just file for divorce and things are that bad, you know what? She's just going to be happy and she's going to be happy to move on. And she won't even, you know, think it's that big of a deal. So here's what I want you to do. If you really want to let her have it, here's what you do. Let's write up the papers today, but then I'm going to put them in my desk drawer. And for the next six months, I want you to go home, and I want you to be the best husband that you can be. I want you to be attentive to her needs. I want you to you know, care for her. I want you to respect and make her feel honored. I want you to serve and sacrifice for her. And then just when she starts to have hope, six months later, we'll pull out those divorce papers, and we'll slam them to her, and that'll really let her have it. And the guy's like, oh, man. I like where this lawyer's head is. This is really going to be, you know, something. And so he uh, goes back and he um, and uh, starts to, to work this plan. And six months later, the lawyer calls and says, "Hey, are you ready for the divorce papers?" And of course, you know the rest of the story. He's like, "Oh, you know what? I don't need them." Yeah. Suddenly, we're experiencing this intimacy, not because I was trying to change her, but because I was trying to take care of me. And that's God's design for marriage. And then the last thing that I just want to bring up is because we need to be honest, is there's something inside all of us. There's this sin, this personal baggage inside all of us. 
And I mentioned um, my son and his wife uh, got married just a little over a year ago. And I, growing up, I, when my kids were growing up, I was never sure that I wanted to do their weddings because I'm like an emotional guy. I knew I was going to like cry <laughs> through these whole things. So I'm like, I don't know if I want to do it. But they, they really wanted me to. So I said, OK, I'll do the wedding. And we agreed to it. And so I did what I did with most couples. like. A couple months ahead of time, I said, hey, you know, I'd like you to choose a passage, a Bible passage, um, for the, the wedding. And so they were thinking about that. And then I got this text message from my future daughter-in-law. Her name is Jessica. And she text messaged me, and she said this, Glenn, in August of 2017, you preached a sermon on Hebrews 12 about the kingdom of God being an unshakable foundation upon which to build your life. And then she reminded me of five points in that sermon. And she said, I thought that would be a great scripture for our wedding <laughs> ceremony. Now, my first thought is, any girl that remembers five points from a sermon I did six years ago definitely is welcome in our family. So I'm like, 100%, you could come on in. But I'm like, well, Jessica, that's not even a passage about marriage. It's not even really a passage about love. But man, this girl is so wise because what it was about was about throwing off the sin that entangles us and running a race with endurance and, 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 and keeping our eyes on Christ and building your life on the foundation of the kingdom of God that will not be shaken. And my encouragement today is we've talked a lot about kind of theology, and I think it's good. We need to have that picture in our head. But where the hope and where the promise comes from is our eyes on Christ. And if you're in that crisis moment now or you just need a little tune-up or maybe you're even trying to decide what the next steps are in your relationship, the very first thing you should do is fix your eyes on Jesus and fix your eyes on Christ and begin to build your life on his kingdom and his foundation and then see what he does. So, Father, I thank you so much for Lifeline Church. I thank you for their heart as to a church to study um, that home is where the heart is. And so I pray, Lord, as we've talked about marriage today, that that would just be helpful, that you would strengthen every relationship that's here. People are on all sorts of continuum of where we are in, in marriage. But I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would give them hope. I pray that this church would be a place full of the, the goodness and life of strong marriages and strong families. Bless them. And I pray, Lord, where we need change, that we would begin by fixing our eyes on you and that you would do great things. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. amen.